Morning. 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 Let's open up our Bibles this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Just a minute, we're going to continue in our teaching through the book of 1 Samuel. We've come out of the Judges, we're into the Kings now, the era of the Judges that ruled in Israel to keep them uh, coming back to God and staying in right order with God has passed. Israel demanded a king. They broke God's heart, but he gave them what they wanted. So the kings are established here. We see one king that the people chose, Saul. He's coming uh, to the end of his reign. He's been reckless. He's been disobedient. God has rejected him. God's raised up another king in David, one of Jesse's sons. We catch up with David here in a very familiar, uh, famous passage of Scripture where he faces off against Goliath. And we see uh, chapter 17 will set most of this up for us this morning. A lot of powerful principles in here. Uh, Sister Kim's going to come read uh, verses 1 through 30 for you in just a moment. But I'm going to thank God for the word and then we'll jump in. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that we have the Holy Spirit in us to guide us and to lead us into all truth. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to see and hear and know the principles that are tucked as gems and treasures in your word this morning. So that on Monday we'll have a different perspective. We'll have a different mindset because of what you've done in our hearts today. We ask all this in Jesus' name and the church said, Amen. Amen. So Sister Kim, verses 1 through 30. For Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Soko and Ezekah in ephes -Damon. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier, or his shield carrier also walked before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, the second to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. The Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. Verse 17, then Jesse said to David his son, take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand, and look into the welfare of your brothers, and bring back news of them. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning, and left the flock with a keeper, and took the supplies, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp, while the army was going out in battle, array, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, 
The Philistine from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. And it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Verse 26. <coughs> then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him in one accord with this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. A lot going on there. The battle's been put in array, yet some things are different here. It's not the way things usually have gone for Israel. And we pick up in verse 1 here with the Philistines being the perennial thorn in Israel's side. If you've ever had someone or something to deal with over and over and over again that constantly opposes you, constantly afflicts you, constantly challenges you, every time you move an inch forward, they try to push you a foot back. This was the Philistines to Israel. Now understand, God uses the enemies of his people to perfect his people. Come on, don't be so quiet on Sunday morning. You know, there's a purpose to what we go through, especially when we're, our hearts are right and we're following the Lord. There's a purpose. God's using these Philistines, but the Philistines were no fun for Israel. And here they are again, doing what Philistines do, opposing, harassing, afflicting the people of God. They're a type of Satan in that they do things in the way that the enemy would do. And we're going to see the enemy's fingerprints all over this situation here with David and Goliath. This is a very famous passage of scripture this morning, yet I think we miss a lot of what's going on if we don't dig deep. Now, in verses 2 and 3, the two armies have faced off. Now I want you to see, the Bible doesn't give us details by accident. It gives them to us on purpose. Notice what verses 2 and 3 say. That one army was on the far ridge, and another army is on the ridge opposite them. And in the middle, there's a valley. Now the reason the word of the Lord takes the time to describe that this morning is because what we're seeing here is a stalemate. There are two opposite ridges. There's a valley between them. There's terrain between them. And neither army have a tactical advantage here. It's neutral. Amen. What I want you to see is your enemy never wants to get in a fair fight with you. <laughs> Come on, are there any Christians here this morning? I said the devil never wants to get in a fair fight with you. Because if he does, greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Amen. Amen. So what you're seeing is the Philistines, amen, somebody loves Jesus this morning. You know, the Philistines don't want to get a fair fight with Israel. So what they do is they change up the rules here. They know if they both come down to the valley, they both have to negotiate the terrain, they both have to meet on equal footing, and they don't want a fair fight. So it's a stalemate, and they think of another way. In verse 4, here's what they come up with. Then a champion came from among the armies of the Philistines named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Let's just stop. So what they did is because they didn't want to get a fair fight, they gave a counteroffer. And their counteroffer, so his name was Goliath, and we're going to talk about him in just a minute here. And he, they say, well, you know what, let's not have a fair fight. Let's have a fight that's tilted in our favor because we have a champion. So the champion says, I'll face any one of you in single combat. You beat me, we serve you, you beat us, and, and it comes down to one-on-one. -on -one. Now, understand, armies did this back in the day. They settled disputes like this where there was, you know, maybe it was equal and there was going to be a lot of unnecessary bloodshed. So they came up with a way to minimize the bloodshed. 
But the Philistines were not doing that. The Philistines were doing what Philistines do, tipping the odds in their favor. Because when you see this guy that they send out, you know, he's not your average ordinary foot soldier. <laughs> Goliath, described to us in the verses 4 through 7, Goliath is the stuff that nightmares are made of. <laughs> Come on, how many of you have ever had nightmares about running from giants or like, you know, pushing someone in there? Or guys, we, I don't know, guys have dreams like that. You're wrestling with someone, you just can't beat them. If you're hammering this guy, you're hitting him, he won't go down. <laughs> Anybody? Just me? <laughs> and I mean, it's like, this is the stuff that nightmares are made out of. Here's this Goliath guy, and he comes down. And I mean, you could probably see him coming a long way off. And they're like, is there three of them? Are they on each of their shoulders? What's going on? I mean, here comes Goliath, and, and he is scary. Verse 4 says he's six cubits and a span. Anybody measure with cubits this week? No. <laughs> You know, a unit of measurement that, you know, we don't really understand whether the scholars look at it. They're estimating this guy was anywhere between, you know, he was probably about nine foot six inches tall. Nine, six nine is scary enough. Hello? Nine six, the NBA would have snapped him up in a heartbeat. Come on, he only needs a four inch vertical to, to dunk. <laughs> So here's Goliath. He's humongous. He's nine foot six. He, he's a freak of nature. You know, the estimates by his height and, and his stature being in good shape, if he's not too thick in the middle, this guy's about 400 pounds. Nine foot six, 400 pounds, no toothbrush, unshowered. <laughs> Some of you didn't even flinch at that. That's <laughs> Verses 5, his armor alone, he had a chain mail, some kind of sheet mail armor. It was 125 pounds just of armor. Some of you don't weigh 125 pounds. They, I don't know what, David was a little guy. You know, he's down there, and here comes this guy. Just his armor is 125 pounds. He's pushing 400 pounds. He's 9 foot 6. He's fully armored, and he's fully armed. He has a spear, and a shield, and a javelin, and a sword, and an armor bearer to fight alongside with him. What was that guy's job? Just cheer? Great job. <laughs> so here he comes. Verse 7 tells us just the tip of his spear, when you do the math on that conversion there, just the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. That's like a sledgehammer. <coughs> Big guy. Bad guy. Physically intimidating to everyone and anyone who was there that day. He steps down. This is their champion. This is what the Philistines want to present as an alternative to mutual combat. They present this guy to fight single combat, one-on-one, -on -one, winner take all. Now let's be honest, nobody would want to face this guy one-on-one. -on -one. And you'd be wise to do that. And I want to say something to you. The Philistines knew it was their advantage. Everybody knew it there. But that's what they were offering. And I want to say something to you. Don't ever let pride drag you into a fight that you can't win. <laughs> Some people don't get this. Some people don't understand. Well, you know, you know, you can quote a few scriptures. Greater who's in me than he. And, you know, you just, you, listen, you don't get into fights unless God tells you to. Amen. There are some battles you and I can't win. You and I can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. He's smarter than us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's been watching us and studying us since we were born. Some fights we shouldn't get into. And it's pride that sucks us in. Pride will get us to write checks that we can't cash and get into situations where, you know, we give the enemy the advantage. Why would Israel want to give the Philistines this advantage? It's that, that's what the devil offers because he never wants a fair fight. Don't you realize you and I in a fair fight with Jesus on our side, with the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, with us tucked safely in the Father's arms this morning? You know, there's no way we can lose. So pride is not an issue for, these soldiers must be the most humble soldiers ever because nobody wants to fight him. That was a joke. 
They're scared. They're petrified. They don't want anything to do with them. They're not being suckered in. They don't want to give them the advantage. Understand, for a man to step forward and say, I'll take the fight, was not only risking his life, but was risking the security of his whole nation. Yeah. On the shoulders of you. You would have to step forward and say, yeah, I'll stand in there for Israel. And if I fail, all of you are slaves. Yeah. That's huge. A huge responsibility. No one was willing to take it, including King Saul. And so they're at a stalemate here. <laughs> Goliath's stature and his military prowess are obviously, you know, just something to behold. But as if that wasn't enough, verse 8 tells us that the guy also has a mouth on him. Listen to this. So it says he stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. So he's not only a world-class warrior, he is a world-class trash talker. <laughs> And we're going to see he gets out there and he taunts and he defiles and, and he insults Amen. the people of God. Amen. And you say, well, why, does, why do we need to think about that? Because I want you to understand how your enemy comes at you. Your enemy's always, he's not just going to physically intimidate you. He's going to use words. The enemy is, the devil has always used words to trip up God's people. Amen. You see the way he worked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He used words. Maybe he'll die. Maybe you won't. God just doesn't want you to be like him. He's holding you back. It was the words that unsettled Adam and Eve till they crossed the line and disobeyed God. It wasn't the threats. Notice that. Now here's an enemy who is physically imposing enough, who is physically intimidating enough that he could probably just stand out there and, and he'd get the point across. But notice. He still uses words, and he intimidates with those words. And God's people have had to deal with the intimidating uh, words of the enemy all throughout history. And this is no different here. His words are crafty. They're seductive. They're unsettling. Listen, everybody who went to their tent after Goliath would taunt for the day would be thinking about those words that he said. Amen. Have you ever had anybody say something to you that just ran over and over again in your mind. Unsettling words. Come on. To where maybe years later, you still think about what they said to you. You'll never. You can't. You're disqualified. Wow. Words are powerful. Watch the words that come out of your mouth and watch the words you take into your heart. Be careful to pay attention who's speaking words into your life. Amen. So Goliath is this huge, intimidating guy, but he's also a, a big mouth and a taunter, and he, he, he attacks the people of God. And this situation, we see that, that really the whole thing is flipped from the way it's supposed to be. The Philistines are confident because they have a champion who's awesome. And the people of God are terrified because they don't know how big their God is. It should be, John, that the people of God are excited about the fact that their God is the creator of heaven and earth. And this is just one man who their God created. Do you notice how things get flipped? Anybody married? The devil wants your house out of order. He'll try and flip all kinds of things in there. Men who are passive and do nothing and sit in front of the TV. Women who do everything and are in charge of everything. No help. Holy cow, this is the most quiet I've ever heard. <laughs> I think the sound system just cocked <laughs> out. He likes to put things out of order, and, and it's out of order here. There, there's a, a backward situation. God's people are terrified. The heathen are confident. He's out there. He's speaking words that are just unsettling. And the people of God at this point are just in a full-scale panic. In verse 8, uh, we see that he says something that betrays him. And it's really going to be his undoing here. Look what he says. He says, why do you draw up? Am I not the Philistine? Okay. You're the champion. We get it. And you are the servants of Saul. Did you hear that? Were they the servants of Saul? No. They were the servants of the living God. Amen. See, and this is the thing we've got to understand here today. 
the enemy will always cast you uh, in a way that you you know will undermine who you are in God. They weren't the servants of Saul. They were servants of God. If they were the servants of Saul, they would be in trouble because Saul himself was afraid to fight with this guy. But God in heaven had the whole situation under control. So notice, let your enemy talk sometimes. Goliath says some things and he betrays his own heart. It's his own undoing there. He thinks he's taking on a, a few small soldiers, some single man who's going to be a few feet shorter than him, but he doesn't realize he's taking on the God of heaven and earth and he's doomed. Amen. Verses 9, what he's peddling here in verse 9 is that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a one deal. I win, you guys take us as your servants. Uh, if I beat you, you know, all of Israel belongs to us. So he, he lays out the stakes. Verses 10 and 11, he taunts them day after day for the one-on-one -on -one fight, and no one accepts the challenge. Listen again to the words of the enemy. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So his words and his taunt and his physical threats produce exactly what the enemy wanted to produce in Israel, fear and dismay. Their confidence was crushed. They were terrified. They didn't fall back on their God. And yet all they could see was this giant in front of them. And, and all of Israel was in a panic. Now in verses 12 and 15, David, Jesse's youngest son, appears to be bouncing back and forth between Saul and his father. Remember when we last left David, what was he doing? He was playing the harp for Saul. And he was connecting with Saul, and, and he was driving away the evil spirit from the Lord that was afflicting Saul, so he had found his place with the king. But this verse shows that these verses show us here that David also was bouncing back and forth between serving his king and his father. And so he's a little conflicted here. It said, David, the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. Jesse was old in those days and advancing in years. The three older sons of Jesse had gone to the battle. So remember the older brothers, there was a bunch of them, but the, the oldest three, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, they had all gone to the battle with Saul. But listen, it says here in verse 14, David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flocks at Bethlehem. So David, even though he was anointed as king, he still overlooked for the battle. No one even thinks to send him out there. Even though he had favor with Saul, he still overlooked for the battle. In fact, David, who's been anointed as king, who has found his place in the king's court, is now back out with the sheep. Come on, do you ever have days like that? I'm promoted. I'm still doing the same thing. I'm doing my job and your job now. Anybody get promoted like that? Come on. And so... You know, here's David and he's bouncing around. He hasn't really found his place yet. Even though, you know, he, he, he was the king's armor bearer. He had connected with Saul. And, you know, there was this connection there with the driving away the evil spirit. That made him important. But he still overlooked. People have not figured out who this David is yet. And God was about to establish him in a way that he would never be able to go backwards to the sheep again. Verse 16 shows us how depressing the situation had come. I mean, it was getting pretty bad here for Israel. The Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. So this big, huge, unshowered Philistine, uncircumcised, ugly, <laughs> comes out twice a day for his daily rant and shoots his mouth off and horrifies everybody. How'd you like to go to a party like that? Wow. I mean, it's, you know, it's bad enough, you know, it's bad enough to be insulted, to be taunted, to be called out in public, but twice a day for 40 days? The morale had to be gone. And it's a dire situation here. The Philistines have a champion. It seems like Israel has no champion. He says, I defy the ranks of Israel. Still hasn't get it. Taunting. He produces the fear. He produces the dismay. And, you know, it's a very, very bad situation. Verses 17 through 19. 
David gets sent on a resupply mission to his brothers. So there again, David is just seen as the little guy. His father tells him, you know, take this food and go check on your brothers and report back to me. So he's still kind of being a little servant boy, even though God's anointing was upon him. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. So he goes out there, and when he gets out there and he finds his brothers, he's going to hear for the first time when everybody else had been hearing for 40 days. I want you to see something here, verses 20 through 23, as David goes out and finds his brother. So David rose early in the morning and left the flock with the keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting their war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in the battle array and the army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brother. So a lot's going on here and I want, I want you to take a look at it here. So he goes out, he's obedient to his father, he's a good servant. He goes to resupply his brothers and he delivers the care package to them. He's beginning to hear... Uh, you know, what's going on here? He's catching up to where everybody else is. Now, I want you to see one thing here. Notice what David did with his baggages. Did you hear what he, what he did with his bags? Anybody pick that up? Tell me, what did he do? He left him with the baggage keeper. Think back to Saul. Remember when Saul was supposed to be anointed king, what did he do with the bags? He hid among them. Why does the Bible keep talking about baggage? Because baggage is a big issue for all of us. Saul hid among the baggage, and they were like, where's Saul? We want to anoint him as king. He's hiding among his baggage. How many of us do that? God's calling us. God's trying to promote us. God's trying to bring us to new anointings, new levels, new areas of breakthrough. And we're hiding in the past amongst our baggage. I wish there were some Christians here this morning. David is not like Saul. He doesn't stay with his bags. He leaves his baggage behind and he runs to the battle. God's looking for some people like that today. My God, what did you guys do on Saturday night? I want you to see, there's nothing in the scripture by accident. The fact that Saul stayed with the bags and David left them shows the difference between David and Saul. He resupplies his brothers, and now he wants to catch up on what's going on here. He wants to hear, and he, he begins to hear for the first time, you know, why everybody's so terrified here. Now, notice the words that Goliath says affect everybody one way, but they affect David a different way. It's okay to be different. It's okay to have a different opinion. You know, this world is so hell-bent on making everyone lockstep with their opinions. Now, as a Christian, if you have a different opinion than the world now, you're called all kinds of names. It's unacceptable for us to agree with God's word and not be lockstep with the world. Everybody's in lockstep. What's the word on Goliath? We're terrified. David hears what's going on there, and he has a, he has a different... He has a different take on things if you pick up in verse 24. While all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. So that's the people's response. Then the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming to defy Israel. Well, he's been doing it twice a day for 40 days, so that's a good one there. Uh, this guy's real perceptive. Uh, it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke up, verse 26, to the men who were standing by to him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? The people answered him according to with this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now, Understand, David is hearing what everybody else heard, but he has a different response. His response is not, man, look at the size of this guy. There's no way anybody can beat him in the natural, in the flesh. He, I mean, there's no way. His response is, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? God is 
is still looking people for people in the kingdom who will dare to believe in their God. That will dare to stand before the enemy and say, our God is bigger, greater as he is in you than he is in the world. Amen. We've gotten so used to shrinking back, so used to giving up ground, so used to being pushed in a corner that we think that's the way it's supposed to be. God wants to raise up some Davids. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? See, David knew right away he wasn't challenging the army. He wasn't challenging warriors. He was challenging God. Always know who stands behind you and I. It's not our resume. It's not our achievements. It's not our abilities. It's not our intelligence or our athleticism or, you know, who thinks we're great. Who stands behind us is the creator of heaven and earth. So David has a different take, and he wants to know what's going to be done, you know, for the person. And, and look at, you know, right away, David, David looks past him and says, what's the reward for taking him out? <laughs> I like this guy. Now, that's human nature, right? We, we want to know, you know, what's in it for me, all right? So there's a little human nature. God wired us that way, amen? amen. There's nobody who works a whole week and just says, keep it. <laughs> Right? He's like, where's my pay? And if God help us, it's a little short. Oh, you guys are too holy. You're just like... So he wants to know what's in it. And, you know, 24 and 25 kind of, kind of tell us, uh, it says here, um, basically that, you know, he'll have great riches. He'll have the king's daughter in marriage. And that, you know, his house will live free in Israel. So let's just take a look at this here. The king was rich. And everybody worked for the king. So when the king says, if you take this guy out, you're going to be rich. You're going to go from a filthy foot soldier, you know, putting his life on the line for the nation, to being wealthy and comfortable. Amen. Sound good to anybody? Amen. No, nobody wants it. <laughs> and on top of that, you're going to get the king's daughter. Look, now, we don't have pictures. <laughs> I don't know what she looked like. <laughs> but... It was probably a good thing to get the king's daughter because then you were in the royal family. And they must have fed her and clothed her and she probably had most of her teeth, so she was probably a gem back then. <laughs> so you get rich, you get the king's daughter, and then the last one, this should make all you people who live in New York excited. You're going to live tax-free in the land. <laughs> now you get the whole book. Now you're excited. I'm talking about God. How great is our God? <laughs> Tax free. <Woo! laughs> God help us. But that's the deal. David wants to know what the deal is. Now, uh, he wants to know what he gets, and this is what he gets, and he probably liked what he heard. David sees Goliath for exactly what he is. Verses 26 and 27 show us. David spoke to the man who were standing by him. <coughs> what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And he wants to know. Okay, that's great. The people answered him according to the words, saying, thus will be done for him. And so uh, he, uh, he understands that he's going to get something. He sees the Philistine as a reproach to Israel, as defying the living God, and he sees the reward for taking him out as something that's available to him. It's a great perspective, and I want you to see that only David, he's the only one there that's thinking this. Please, dare to be different. Dare to believe your God. Dare to think out of the box sometimes. Amen. Help us to think more like David and more like people who are, less like people who are just scared of everything, Lord. Verse 28, we see David's older brother, and the close down. Uh, kind of with this here, but it says Eliab, the oldest brother, heard him speaking to the man. And listen, Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the insolence and the wickedness of your heart. For you have come down in order to see the battle. So let's just stop there, right there. Remember, Eliab was the oldest brother. When he got before Samuel, he was a specimen. Remember, Samuel said, oh, this has got to be the king. This, is, this one, he, he looks like an action figure. He's a good-looking guy. Right? And God said to him, don't look at his outer appearance. I've rejected him. Wow. 
So here's the older brother who's been rejected, and here comes little brother. And, and we noted at that time when Samuel skipped over all the brothers and then anointed David that this made David the most popular brother in the family. <laughs> right? And you can feel all the warm, fuzzy feelings right there. His older brother is so happy to see him. So the vitriol and the angst that I said would be there is there, and we see it here in the in the response. He's angry. He shows disdain for him. Uh, remember, David, this little guy's anointed, but the brother speaks to him and he insults him, and then he judges him. Listen to the words of his mouth: "With whom have you left those?" few sheep in the wilderness. I don't know if you're picking up what he's laying down there, but let me embellish it a little bit. Hey, nobody, who did you leave those few flea-bitten worthless sheep with out in the wilderness? What are you doing here? You're not important. Remember all that stuff the prophet said to you? Well, none of us believe it, so why don't you go back in the wilderness? Helps when you read between the lines. <laughs> He was really dressing his brother down. He was really insulting him. He was saying that he's insignificant. What he does is insignificant, and he'll never be significant, so just run along. But it gets worse. After he insults him, he judges him. I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart. So now the older brother was God Jr. <laughs> he can discern the thoughts and intents of other people's hearts. Have you ever had people like that in your life that would judge you as if they knew the inner workings of your heart and your mind? What an ugly situation here. Not a pretty thing. You know, surely David looked up to his older brother to a degree. I'm sure he was concerned about his welfare as he was in the battle here. But all he gets from him is insults and judgments. And the, the rift between them is big and it's ugly and it's all about God's hand on David's life. Some people are not going to celebrate what God wants to do in your life. So you and I have to learn to deal with the insults and the accusations. You know, many times people are going to attack. It seems like they're attacking us, but we're, really what they're attacking is God in us. And how we handle. Listen, you and I have to learn how to handle our critics. I always, I'm always shocked that people say, well, I, ha I have no critics. <laughs> You just need to listen closer. Maybe you need to hide behind the wall at the water cooler at work. Maybe, I've been in situations where I was in another room and people thought I had left and they started talking about me because they thought I was gone. I remember one time laying on a hammock just listening to them. Oh, it was rich. You know, because people don't say what they really think to your face. Amen. Everybody looks uncomfortable. <laughs> so he comes out and he attacks him. Now, how's David going to handle with the criticism? How's he going to? We need to learn to handle people who are against us, people who are provocateurs, people who are critics. It's important. If you and I don't understand how to handle them, many times we can allow their words, like because sometimes it's not even them speaking; it's straight up the enemy. But their words can hurt us and derail us and get us to quit. <laughs> Have you ever had someone speaking to you and you knew that it wasn't even them speaking by the words that were coming out of their mouth? Come on, I've had people saying stuff to me and I'm like, I, that ain't you, you ain't even smart enough to use those words. <laughs> and put them in the right order in a sentence. See, that ain't you. And it's just like the devil speaking right to him. Devil, devil, devil. Anybody have the devil talk to you? Maybe somebody in a nice suit. No, that ain't for God. And you'll never, and you can't, and you're unqualified, and you're disqualified, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's the devil. So when the devil speaks, what do we do? When Eliab speaks and tears him down, does David mope home and go home and go home with his tail between his legs? He's right. Look at him, you know, look at me. And, you know, and miss his date with destiny because of the words of a critic? There are two ways to handle criticism. We can either be like a duck or a sponge. Now, if you know about ducks, they have water, they have oils in their, in their feathers and stuff that when you drop water on a duck because ducks go in the water, the water just beads off and rolls off. How many have ever seen this? 
seen pictures, heard stories. Right, okay. So we get it. A duck is built that way, didn't evolve that way, sorry, God made it that way, knew it was going in the water, the water rolls off. Okay, so sometimes people say stuff to us, and when we know it's not God, we gotta let it just roll off. But sometimes we gotta be like a sponge. Because sometimes somebody's gonna say something to us, and unless we suck it up and take it to heart and make some changes in our life, we're never going to have our day with destiny. The trick is knowing to be when it's time to be the duck and when it's time to be the sponge. And you know what? We get it wrong all the time. People say stuff to us and they hurl all these insults at us and we, so we soak it up and take it to heart and it crushes us. And God was like, that wasn't me. <coughs> Let it roll off. And sometimes people will come and correct us and point out flaws in us and point out sin in our life and we let it roll off when we should have we should have soaked it up because our souls are on the chopping block unless we deal with sin faithful are the wounds of a friend so when someone tells you something hard now listen to me uh, you know friends can tell us you know well God I'll listen to correction if someone gives it to me and smiles and hugs me and then gives me a donut then I'll listen <laughs> it don't always work like that sometimes the correction of an enemy is right I've had people say things to me. I knew they weren't for me. They weren't even believers. They hated God. They hated me talking about God. And they'd say something to me, Charles. And when I'd walk away, God would say, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean what I think? It was right, wasn't it? Whose side are you on? <laughs> you know, but then later on, you have to, you have to say they were right. Yeah. <laughs> you guys look so uncomfortable. <laughs> God can use an enemy to correct us. God can use a faithful friend to correct us. But we need, we need to have the Holy Spirit in us to know when to be the duck and when to be the sponge. When we get it wrong, that's when things go bad. We say, how do we do this, Pastor? We pray and we stay in the Word, but we also surround ourselves with honest people. Amen. You and I need people in our life that can just tell us the truth. Not the truth. <laughs> it was a trickle, but you know, we it, look. If you walk around with garlic bread all day and your zipper down, you don't have any good friends, <laughs> right? You got somebody got to. You know, I know. So, nobody, nobody said anything. No one's looking out for me. <laughs> I can tell some zipper stories. I'm getting old. Now. <laughs> but you and I need people around us to tell us the truth. But you know, people who don't like truth, they surround themselves with yes people. Yeah. Oh, just yeah. Oh, you're the best. You're the great. I'm in your fan club. I'll like everything you put on Facebook. And I'm, you're the best. And you're and listen. We don't need people. If that's the only people you, you know, you're out of shape. So what do you do? You get fatter friends. <laughs> you know people like that? I'm the skinniest one in the group. <laughs> when you ain't skinny. I'm just trying to wake you up this morning. Right? We need people who are just going to tell us the truth. And you know what? David... David was able to discern what was the truth and what he needed to take to heart, he let his brother's words just roll off his back. Do you know that must have infuriated his older brother even more? Yeah. I would love to see, I, I always say, I wish we had a picture about him. I would love to see his brother's face after he killed Goliath. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, it would be so awesome. I hope there's an art gallery in heaven where we can see those shots. But, Surround yourself with honest people who will tell you the truth. And then when you have to take it to heart, make those changes. David had a right heart. He could take correction. We're going to see that in the Psalms and in the course of his life. But no one to be the duck and no one to be the sponge. David lets his brother's accusations roll off and he keeps asking people. And notice what he says to him. He, he basically, you know, I know the wickedness and the insolent of your heart. Okay there, buddy. He, he says... Uh, you know, David said, what have I done now? Did you hear that? Well, that means this has been going on for a while. What have I done now? You're mad at me again? Big surprise. 
Was it not just a question? So it's a, it's a question. It's a just question. I want to know what's going on. And he walks away from his brother in verse 30. Then he turned away. And this is a good thing. Sometimes we have to walk away from people who are spouting out garbage. Amen? Don't just stand there. What other insults do you have for me today? No, just get away from certain people. Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. So he didn't change his question. He didn't tone it down. And the people answered him the same as before. So David kept asking his questions, and he kept having a different response than everybody else. He allowed the accusations to fall off him. He was able to hear truth from the Lord and to discern what to take to heart and what to let to roll off his back. These are skills all of us need to cultivate. And we need the Holy Spirit to do it. Let's bow our heads today. Father, just thank you this morning for this time in the Word. And I pray, Lord God, that we can learn from all of these situations here. We see the enemy and how he taunts and how he brings instability, how he makes accusations against God's holy people. Father, help us to always understand it's not just us in the fight, but you stand behind us. As we walk the path of destiny you've laid out for each of us, you stand with us, you order our steps, and you protect us and defend us. Help us to see the accusations of the world for what they are as David did. Who are these uncircumcised Philistines to attack the purposes of God, to attack God's people, to attack the gospel, to attack the word, to attack the truth that comes from being in a right relationship with Jesus Christ? Give us boldness, God, to face giants. Because there's a lot of giants out there that taunt. They taunt in America and they taunt the church. Raise up David's. Raise them up in this house. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.